So good afternoon and welcome to the ASLA Center for Landscape Architecture. Uh, this is our official opening day and we're really pleased to have you here as part of our schedule of public events. So welcome to um, what is going to be our live streamed lecture on uh, how we gave birth to the ASLA Center. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm Nancy Somerville. I am the have the fortune and privilege of being the CEO of the American Society of Landscape Architects, so it's my pleasure to welcome you. And one quick administrative note before I, I launch us off here. Um, any of you who are looking to get professional development credit in LASIS, um, be sure to see Vanessa at the back of the room and get your name on the list um, so we can make sure that you are properly credited. Uh, you will find Vanessa in the back um, afterwards. So everyone knows, I believe, um, that ASLA's, uh, really the mission of ASLA and the fact that since ASLA was founded in 1899, that what we now call sustainability, but we referred to as stewardship of the land back then, that that value has been front and center part not only of the mission and the core value of the society, but very much of the profession um, for all of those years. So whatever we wanted to do here as ASLA representing the profession is very much informed by that core value. Um, that was the value that was in mind for us when we did our demonstration green roof back in 2006. And it was a motivating, um, really core part of what we are doing uh, when we moved on to and took the project to move from our headquarters into creating the Center for Landscape Architecture. Um, so our goals were really to expand our ability to do the kind of thing that we're doing today, to really be a convener, to bring the public in, as well as the profession and other designers, um, to talk about the, the core values, the work, um, and the importance of the profession, uh, it, in order to really um, also showcase the profession and live our mission and our values. Um, again, sustainability being a very important part of that. Uh, so it's now my pleasure. I'm going to turn over this to our really fantastic design team. Um, we were so fortunate uh, in our choice, and I think that's because we were so smart um, in selecting a truly um, wonderful and talented design team that far exceeded um, our expectations. And I think as you'll see kind of where we were and where we ended up, um, you will agree with me. So our speakers today are the core uh, design team members. Uh, Lisa Del Place is a principal at Omi Van Sweden and led the landscape architecture team. And Abram Goodrich is a project manager, uh, a project architect at Gensler, and he was the lead designer for Gensler. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa. Enjoy. Thank you, Nancy. Well, it's wonderful be, to uh, be speaking here today. This is pretty incredible. I've watched this really transform, and um, it's amazing. But I think it's important to take a step back and see where we started, because sometimes, even though it hasn't been that long, we often forget where we started. So this building, along with the building next to it, um, was designed to look and fit into the historic quality of um, Chinatown, but it was actually built in 1996. And it, there were all kinds of issues, and so when we started looking at this project, we wanted to really kind of challenge the, the underlying assumptions about what we wanted to do for the project. One of them was this idea of, of kind of being transparent. So um, initially, the storefronts on both buildings, you can see the one next door is completely papered over. And ASLA used to have a bookstore. And so the windows for the storefront of ASLA looked into the bookstore. But when the bookstore went away, it was just papered over with a beautiful image of the green roof. But it really wasn't transparent as it is today. Um, even more compelling was what you saw on every floor of the building. So um, I kind of liken it to a labyrinth. Um, sunlight didn't go through. Um, the ceilings were low. The dividers for the cubicles were high. And literally, you couldn't find your way around. And it was interesting because we actually noticed that there was an alien 
kind of stalking in the back, not really uh, knowing that the alien was there. So um, equally disturbing and challenging if you were a visitor to ASLA was a scissor stare. Um, you know, I often, and I came here quite a bit, uh, as pre president of the Potomac chapter, would always get confused in the scissor stairs. I could never figure out if I was coming in the front part of the building or the back part. So it was a challenge that really needed to be addressed. The conference uh, room was in the lower garden level, um, but again, it had the same kind of challenges as the rest of the floors, the low ceiling and kind of limited light, even though it was adjacent to the garden level. What's interesting here is that the garden itself, the garden level, is only 11 feet wide and it's flanked on both sides by these two buildings. But it was also challenged because it had high walls along I Street, so no one could really see into the space, but it also limited the light. But the real jewel of ASLA was the green roof. And so when we started thinking about next steps, we wanted to utilize what ASLA had done by implementing the green roof in 2006. Um, it's been a great and tremendous source for the profession, and it's been a wonderful um, uh, area that's used by, for education and community groups. In fact, there was a school group here today. So, um, it really kind of provided this idea moving forward about what the landscape could be. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Abram. He's going to talk about the early concepts. Good afternoon. Happy you're all here. Um, and it's, it's great to be in a working space. Uh, it's kind of like you never quite expect this day is going to happen when you're worried about, you know, the details and there's dust everywhere. It's hard to imagine that one day you'd be in this space behind a microphone with slides, uh, but it's happening uh, and that's great. Uh, and this is really, I actually want to uh, uh, appreciate Nancy's leadership in getting ASLA to this point because it really it takes some vision and it takes some bravery to uh, look at a renovation and uh, and make the big jump that it takes to make something special. Um, and that's really what I want to talk to you about right now, which is how did we how did we get to the shape of this project? Because it didn't just pop out of the box this way. There was a, a process of first us learning about ASLA, trying to figure out what mattered here. Uh, and then the design team working very closely with ASLA staff to figure out how to achieve the, the things that ASLA wanted to do. And in fact, I was thinking, Nancy, that when, when we started this project, there was, at least as far as I know, no center for landscape architecture envisioned. So. Part of what happened is that it emerged that what we were making was, in fact, a center for landscape architecture. So let's talk for a minute about how, where we started. This is the footprint of this building before we, we went to work on it. And what we've done here is kind of like what you would have seen on my desk uh, about three years ago, which is we'll take out everything off of a typical floor that's not essential. So what's left is an elevator, that's the, the box with the X in it, and a stair. And this is a kind of stair that we call a scissor stair because it's effectively two stairs that are twisted around each other. And almost every building needs to have two means of egress, two fire stairs for safety. This building had the two stairs by twisting them together. Today you can't do this anymore. If you did a new building, it wouldn't be legal. But, um, if you have it in a building that's old, you're allowed to kind of keep it and, and, and move forward. Um, so I had a drawing like this on my desk, very much like this three years ago. I was trying to sketch out what the new interiors would be. Gensler was hired to renovate the interiors. Uh, and I, was, I went to our principal's office, Lisa Amster. She asked me, how are things going? I mean, show, you know, show me some of your sketches. Let's see how this is coming out. And I, I showed her what I was working on. I said, you know, it's just, 
it's just not great. I mean, I, I feel like we're not really doing any, anything that's that much different from what we had before. And she said, well, you know, what, why is that? And I said, it's the stare. You know, it just, it kind of pushes you around in the plan. I can't really stretch out, can't get any elbow room. And we knew that ASLA didn't use the elevator. They used the stairs all day long. And anyone who has had the experience of moving around in the scissor stair uh, knows it's extremely disorienting. You go in one door, you pop out, and you're surprised that you popped out in that particular part of the plan. Somehow there's nothing that's entirely intuitive about how you move through these stairs. And that was defining every movement of their every day I was moving through the stair. So I said, you know, Lisa, I, I kind of feel like if we want this to be good, we're going to have to make that stair open. She's like, well, why not do it? And I said, well, you know, it's two means of egress. If we, if we open it up, we don't have egress anymore. And she said, well, have you thought about, you know, how you might pull it off? I said, well, you know, it's kind of crazy. We'd have to add a stair to the back of the building to make up for making this one open. And she said, well, I think you have to propose that. And I was like, okay. So our interior renovation started at that point, at least in our sketches, to take a very different path. And what you're seeing here is one of those very first sketches. This is the first plan that ASLA saw when we presented concepts. And what it shows in the middle there, you can see a new X uh, next to half of the stair. What we had proposed there was that we would demolish the container around that scissor stair. It was a cinder block container. We would demolish that, blow it entirely open, and we would delete one half of the stair. So we would have one path now to take us up, but we we would have all this kind of open space around it and the ability to see through that space that we didn't have before. But to make that work, we had to add that to the back of the building. And we knew that that was gonna be a big, that was gonna be a big leap. Uh, and we actually went to this presentation wondering whether ASLA would be ready to make that leap. Um, we presented with a new exterior stair out here uh, we showed it as something enclosed and with green roofing on the top of it. Um, and we also had to talk about the level below us, which we call the garden level. Uh, Lisa showed you a couple of photos of that. Uh, here we are standing at street level. You go down 12 feet, you find the garden level, and you have this small yard off to the side. That level also needs, needs uh, two means of egress to comply with code. And we really weren't thinking that we would take this new stair at the back and drill it down through the dirt and have it connect to the lower level. That just seemed like an absurd proposition. So what we came to, to understand is that we would need to have, as your second path, we would have people leave the building, go into that garden, and they, they would need to be able to either walk to I Street or walk to the, the alley. So our interior renovation now is starting to push us out into other spaces. The back for the stair, into the side yard, uh, where we now have a staircase that's, that we're obligated to add that will take us to I Street. So this decision to open the stair really became kind of the driver of a, a very different project. Uh, here's the, our first kind of picture of what that path was gonna be like from the side yard to take you up to the street. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice kind of a big cylinder up there, I'll explain what that is in a little bit later. Uh, originally, as Lisa mentioned, you saw a photo of uh, the, the big conference room that used to be here. That was kind of directly below where I'm standing right now. And the notion was, it was associated with the garden and it had doors, so if you had a big meeting, you could open those doors and have people kind of spill out into the garden, which was a, a sound idea. But there was something a little bit counterintuitive about the placement of those spaces in that they weren't here at street level where you would bring the public in. So if you had a meeting, you'd always have the experience of being brought in, and then they'd say, well, take the stair downstairs. You'd go into this disorienting stair and pop out and be confused about where you were, and it was just not a great experience of coming to this place. So we said, since we're scrambling everything, let's do what is a little more logical 
and take our primary public spaces and put them here on street level. And once we do that, it seemed like a pretty simple proposition, or at least a logical uh, proposition to say, let's take those public spaces and open them up to the street. So we said, let's rethink our storefront. And uh, I'm actually going to walk over to the screen. I, uh, I'm kind of a pointing at the screen kind of guy. Um, there was, hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, in the old composition of the storefront, this pier came all the way down and kind of divided this into two sections of, of glazing. And we, we kind of broke one of the rules of architecture that says you should always have a column come down and express itself fully, you know, uh, with the, the visual logic of gravity all the way to, down to the ground. We said we're just going to break that rule in the interest of being more open here. Uh, and you can go across the street and see if it bothers you. Uh, <laughs> but um, once we'd done that, we needed a new canopy. And that was another opportunity to say, how are we going to speak to the essence of ASLA? And it was uh, kind of a no-brainer to say it needs to be green. We really want to think of this as, as an extension of what they've accomplished on the rooftop. Um, and that you can't see that today, because we don't have plants in there yet. But hopefully in a year, you'll come back, and there will be a cornucopia of, of uh, plant life kind of spilling out of the gigantic window box that we've made. Uh, so the the cylinder that we see at the side there, uh, that was a placeholder in these first concept drawings for what we would attempt to accomplish with uh, rainwater harvesting. That was something that Nancy, when we met uh, from the very start, she said, when we did that green roof project 10 years ago, it's the one thing that we have regret about, that we did not find a way to reclaim the water that was landing on that garden and put it and keep it on the site and put it to good use. So we knew we had some kind of cistern coming. And we thought, well, this needs to be part of the story. And we want to put it up there front and center and kind of share it with the world. So I think, it, actually, that tiny symbol on there says water. So we went from a fairly straight ahead interior renovation to something that was much more complex. And um, I was thinking of a, a fidget spinner when I, we were sitting here a half an hour ago. So this is what kids are crazy about today. It has like these little ball bearings and you spin it around. And really, we have all these whirling concerns around this, this headquarters space. And the, the job of the design team is really to try to um, balance out these competing demands for attention and to prioritize things and to try to figure out how to come up with a solution that can address as many of these things as possible. So ostensibly, we're going to talk to you about uh, WELL, which this uh, project is uh, attempting to receive certification in. And WELL is a program that's focused around well-being of the users of buildings, the inhabitants of buildings. And uh, LEAD, which of course is leadership in energy and environmental design, um, those are two big drivers, but we have all these other things, too, about how do we make great workplace. Now we're talking about a center for landscape architecture. What does that mean? We have the existing green roof, which is cherished, and how do we uh, get that to, to uh, be a strong part of this current project? Um, and we're also in Chinatown, which demands certain things of people in terms of how you express the architecture to the outside world. So fortunately, at this point in time, after these concepts had kind of generated a outline of the project that this would become, we were able to, to bring onto the project team Irma Van Sweden and Lisa Dellplace. And uh, that kind of began the uh, very rich collaboration between architect and landscape architect. Uh, and we really made a point of facing some of the challenges of this project uh, together. Um, and I think that uh, that's been a very productive collaboration in this case. Uh, so what we thought we would do now is look at some of the kind of central challenges of making a successful, hopefully successful design here, um, and show you kind of the arc of where we started and how we got to, to the final form of the project. So I want to start with daylight. Um, and uh, daylight, we know, doesn't require a lot of explanation, is really a key to making people feel good uh, that's a big part of well-being, and there are metrics in both 
the well building system and in, in LEED that push us to incorporate the experience of daylight uh, to, to building inhabitants. Um, and that was really part of our thinking from those very first concept sketches. We said, if we're gonna make this new space where previously we had the scissor stair, we're gonna open it up. We really need to animate that space with daylight. And what you're seeing here is also the notion that we would think of that interior space that we're making as an extension of the garden, kind of a garden connector that brings us from the street up to the roof. Um, and you will see what almost looks like a satellite dish on the left-hand side of the page. That was going to be our, our reach for how we were gonna get sunlight in. We were basically gonna harvest it, uh, put it in tubes and beam it to where we needed it in the building. Um, and when we started developing this design, we really went down the road of trying to make that work. Uh, it wound up being extremely difficult to pull off. And it turns out that not many people do this. Uh, and there are not that many products out there in the world that will help you do this. But we did find one and that's on the right hand side. Uh, that is an interesting kind of set of optical mirrors that takes sunlight and turns it into almost like a laser beam. And we were going to use that in combination with mirrors to redirect light down into this central space. Uh, we showed these pictures to Nancy of what we would need to do on the rooftop in order to be able to harvest that. Uh, we said in the center of your gathering space, we're gonna introduce this cool architectural moment that sort of shows you the work it's doing to harvest the sunlight. And we said, you know, it, sure, it's gonna take up a little space out here, but it's gonna be kind of cool talking point to your rooftop experience. And uh, the reaction was, no, that's, that is not <laughs> happening at this headquarters project. Uh, we, we really, it was at that moment that I realized that uh, uh, Michael Van Valkenburg's design of the rooftop up there was uh, probably the most cherished part of, of the identity of the ASLA and touching it was really not something we're gonna be permi permitted to do. So we, um, we all put our heads together, not this, just the design team, but also the client and we, said, well, if we're not gonna be able to use these tricks of mirrors and optics, we're gonna to have to do it the old fashioned way and poke a hole in the roof and make a, a new skylight. And we're gonna to need to do that directly over the space that we're trying to illuminate. Um, and that seems simple um, until you actually dig into what that means structurally to pull all that off. And it was quite a lot of work. Um, but uh, particularly if you've spent some time now in this space, I think everyone can agree that that was the right choice to make. Um, and I always kind of rue that I didn't have the, the nerve to, to propose that from the very start. But uh, fortunately, there were more heads than mine in the room. Uh, so I wanted to just come back to that exterior stair for a second. So, so on the left is our first uh, picture of how we were going to execute that. That also began to evolve. We were working with a code consultant to make sure that we were um, taking our creative approach to egress. That's, that is technically one of our exits. Usually you don't have exits that are unenclosed. So we had a code consultant uh, in the mix here who is helping to uh, advise us as to how to navigate our building codes. And in the process of doing that and talking to the district, we realized that we were also going to have to extend our, our second stair up to serve the roof level at which point we were uh, trying massively to try and control the, the cost of what that stair would be. It started to become much more of a kind of fire escape stair, not enclosed. Um, and we realized again, we had another opportunity to weave this into the overall landscape experience of this site. So we wrapped that stair structure with mesh and there is an L-shaped planter at the base uh, that will allow vines. So the vines that we weren't able to get on the interior stair, they actually migrated to the exterior stair. Now we'll grow up the exterior. So I just wanted to go back to a point, um, kind of our first meeting with ASLA and Nancy. And one of the first things she said was, you know, we were able to achieve tremendous things with the green roof. 
And the data and the metrics that we get off of the green roof are instrumental to the profession and to anyone who comes to ASLA. But what we didn't and weren't able to achieve is really undertaking the, the idea of water. So when we came on board and the project had expanded to become something kind of greater than a renovation, we decided that it was tremendously important to incorporate those ideas of water and landscape into every component. And Abram touched on a few, and so I'm just going to go through and talk a little bit. So this was one of our early diagrams where we started saying we have an opportunity to really delve deeply into stormwater runoff and what that means for the Center of Landscape Architecture and ASLA. And we want to take that idea of incorporating the water and capturing all of the stormwater runoff here. And we want to make sure that we can reuse that water. But we wanted to also take this idea of the green roof and fold it down the building. So bringing it to the storefront, taking it out to the new initiative for green streets that ASLA is leading, and bring it into the courtyard. And so we began to kind of weave this idea of inside out and outside in so that when anyone undertakes a renovation of any building, which is the greenest thing you can do, it is also the most challenging because you have to optimize and look for those greatest opportunities to to maximize what you can do on the site. So this is a diagram of kind of our early thinking and the early process. We wanted to understand how much water was being absorbed by the green roof and then measure how much water was running off of the green roof so that we could begin to store it in the cistern, reuse it for the various areas, but that we would also design a system that would measure this so that it becomes this full story about the importance of green roofs, but also the information we need when we're designing green roofs and telling new clients about green roofs, about the energy saving, about the water absorption of the soil. So we came um, to this, and this is a kind of a, a very simplified diagram. Uh, but the system um, is truly revolutionary. So what we are doing here is we are um, bringing uh, weather stations up to the green roof where we're going to be able to monitor exactly how much rain is falling. We're going to be able to monitor how much water is being absorbed into the soil. We're also going to be able to monitor how much water is then cascading off of the roof that is not being absorbed. And then through a series of flow sensors, we're going to be able to determine how much water, when it's being used, and where we need to put it next, all within this cistern idea. So um, it kind of completes the story, um, and it also really fulfills this idea of stewardship and mission of ASLA, about being a good steward in an urban setting where we want to do the right thing. Um, so Abram has talked a little bit about the stair and the stair and the necessity of kind of opening the stair internally uh, to the space, the requirements of being able and having to provide egress outside of the building. But there were some tremendous benefits that I don't think any of us really realized. And that was when we began to punch through the double walls that used to exist along I Street, the sunlight, the light changed completely in the side yard. And it really kind of had this expansive feel from between the staircase that was leading up and the wall being removed. The side yard, although we hadn't changed any of the dimensions, it's still 11 feet wide, but suddenly we got so much more sunlight. And just to give you an idea of what that means, um, as you can see, on the left-hand side is what used to be here, and we've kind of drawn data lines of where we removed that upper wall, and we kept the lower wall, but we punctured through it, so it, it, it opens up the space quite a bit. So Abram also talked about this idea of the cistern, and we really wanted that moment to be kind of out on the street to really convey and complete the story 
about stewardship, sustainability, and stormwater runoff. Um, but, you know, with every renovation, you find challenges. And for us, it was kind of urban soils. Uh, the soils just structurally could not hold the weight of that cistern above ground. It is still there. It's just below ground. Um, but we had ideas about, you know, using that cistern, the water that we collected, to bring it down the staircase and use it as kind of the same ideas, you know, inside a mirror to reflect the light. But what we discovered along the way is as soon as we removed the wall, we actually were able to achieve a lot of the light quality that we were interested in. And so we kind of go back to where we, we started um, with this diagram of thinking about how we were going to incorporate ASLA, the Center for Landscape Architecture, how to thread this green story throughout the entire building, inside and out, and outside in. And so we've literally brought the notion of the green roof down into every surface on the building. So from the exterior egress stair to a green wall, um, through the terrace level and garden level, up the stairs again, folding it, up to the canopy, and then again out to the street level. So, so that now we've threaded the entire story throughout the site. Got to talk about the stairs some more. <laughs> That's kind of at the core of this project. Um, so we talked about uh, the changes that, that we needed to do here to bring daylight in. And actually, kind of parenthetically, I want to talk about, um, you know, we have these metrics, lead, well, they all talk about the importance of daylight. But usually the way you're, you're kind of looking at um, scoring points in those systems, uh, you are thinking about seated individuals and kind of how close they are to windows, how much light is likely to be, you know, uh, in their area or even on their face um, uh, to stimulate circadian rhythms. Um, it's all kind of mapped out and there are ways that you can kind of figure out how to solve it. Strangely enough, having light in this atrium is not anything that registers in any of those kind of point systems. But um, you kind of have to think about the spirit of these systems, uh, uh, rating systems that have been created. And it's and a basic acknowledgement of the, the importance of daylight in our human experience. Um, and uh, that drove us to make that skylight that was such painful change to the upper port, portion of the, the roof. Um, so this is going back to first concepts. Uh, you know, we imagined that we were going to keep this inner wall on the stair. We were going to plant it. Um, and it kind of got us thinking, well, we should always have some kind of vertical surface in there that allows that gives us a canvas for light to play upon. Um, that's number one. And then number two, it's going to be kind of our armature to be able to grow these things. That's where we started, right? Uh, and we thought, this gesture coming down from roof, it's going to be really important how we resolve that when we get down to the ground. Uh, because there is, uh, in this notion of kind of connecting garden with sky, we always want to establish this baseline of, of how things connect to the earth. Uh, and in this moment in time, you know, we actually had a planter with soil in it and plants were growing up out of it. And we said, well, let's really kind of surprise a person when they come through the front door and that there's uh, this, you know, uh, uh, this interior garden that no one could have possibly expected looking from the, the outside in. And we'll have a little fountain here and really establish that ground plane using water as kind of, you know, this thing that we associate with kind of like the lowest point. Um, and uh, as we began to blow the roof off, uh, literally, we, we started to think about this gesture a little bit more seriously. How were we going to make an architecture inside of this atrium space that was going to connect uh, ground and sky? And we really realized that this was a kind of kind of plant that we were making, something that's rooted down in the ground and kind of reaches up towards the sun at the top. 
And it got us thinking about these kind of systems of moving water from top to bottom. That's what Lisa was talking about with our, our uh, rainwater harvesting and reuse. Um, and it uh, became a, a big architectural challenge. How would we take this wall um, and turn that into an expression of this kind of biological imperative? Uh, and we had many studies of how to interpret that using all uh, different kinds of geometries and, and spatial uh, kind of filters between you know, this side of the wall and that side of the wall. Uh, and really it was all in our minds about how are we gonna capture some of that, like leaves, and this scheme actually was called leaf. We had little disks of glass suspended in this matrix of cables that was going to kind of act to, uh, to disperse this sunlight that was coming from above. Um, and we, you know, we no longer had plants in this view on the right at the base of, of our atrium, but we, we still had the notion of water. Now it was getting wrapped up in the idea that this water was actually coming from our cistern. We were gonna bring it into the building and it was gonna come in at street level and then it was gonna cascade down to the lower level. We we're gonna tie everything up with a nice uh, neat bow. Um, and what we started to understand is that this was going to be hideously expensive. Um, so we said, all right, it can't be architecture because the, the budget will never permit that to happen. So maybe this is art. Maybe it can be something that is not in the architecture budget, but is, you know, something that happens outside of that as, as a, a really like a, you know, a post-construction uh, happening within the environment. And we uh, were very serious about that for a long time. We uh, reached out to uh, a bunch of creative um, forward-thinking architects working in, in Berkeley who were exploring 3D printing um, using bio-based plastics, so the plant-derived plastics, and they were going to make for us uh, one of the world's largest installations of, of 3D printed uh, biopolymers. That was going to be our scrim that made that gesture connecting ground to sky, and we were going to do it with kind of the visual language of microscopic uh, cellular structure inside of, of plants. And this was at a point when we were developing some of the capital campaign materials for ASLA to go out and, and fundraise for, uh, for this project. And you can sort of see on the right that we have the, the, that water element became less of a pool and more of a thin scrim. It was going to act to uh, be a, uh, another diffuser of light coming from above. It would sort of reflect off of this pool and it was still cascading down to below. Um, and we again sort of hit the wall in terms of what the budget would support. We hit it both with the cost of that art installation and with the cost of the water feature. Um, actually the water feature was more, believe it or not, it was about a quarter of a million dollars and there's just no way that we could possibly uh, recommend to ASLA that that, um, that was seriously some, something we should pursue. But the challenge remained that we needed to end the bottom of this atrium space in a significant way. So you've probably all been milling around the space and seeing ultimately how we, we chose to, to end that. Um, and I think you can probably appreciate when you look at it that is kind of a frozen waterfall. Um, and we needed to look around for how we were going to materially render that gesture in a way that was meaningful. And we went out to the garden in its development for inspiration. And what Lisa and her team were working on was incorporating black locust end grain wood pavers into the experience of that space. Black locust has a great story. It's super sustainable American wood. And you're able to use it as paving outdoors and it's lasted for uh, generations in some alleys in Chicago, I think. Um, and uh, we realized that instead of dealing in the world of uh, abstractions of nature with architecture and with art, that really what we could do was just go right to the source and, and go to nature itself and uh, find those stalks uh, in the shapes of timbers and they all, in this case, you'll see our end grain at the top of this platform, all that grain is pushing up towards the skylight. And that was our, our way of reconciling the, the challenges of budget and 
the kind of core expression that we thought was important to making a, a very subtle nod to, to nature. But um, coming back to lead and well, you know, why were we working so hard on trying to get that to happen over here? Um, because it's about the, the soul of this place. Uh, you know, this is about landscape and it's about connecting with the outdoors, connecting this interior space with some idea of what it means to be outdoors. And we couldn't lose sight of that. We had to find a way to make that work. And if you look back in here now, you know, you'll see the wood, of course. You'll see the daylight. You'll also see these graphics that creep, like, uh, creep up the stairs almost like uh, tendrils of a plant. All those things are designed to work subtly in concert with each other to uh, create what is called biophilia, which is tapping into the human, just as humans respond positively to sunlight, we also respond positively to seeing a tree or to seeing those kind of twisting vines. We respond uh, because of our programming and evolution to some of the signs and, and symbols that we see in nature. So there is uh, a core concept at work here from Well, which says that we, um, we are going to feed you biophilic I don't even know if that's the right word. We're going to feed you the language of nature through the interior space of this um, uh, headquarters here. So thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've gone too long. Uh, so, um, I don't know if I'm uh, supposed to introduce question and answer, um, but I believe that that is the next uh, step here. So certainly if there's anybody out there who has a question about this presentation or just about the project in general, any aspects of it, we'd be happy to uh, take those questions. And if you don't have questions, that's fine too. I think I have a question, but I think it would be great if you could take it. Thank you very much. I guess we do have a microphone. Any, anybody? Yes. Hmm. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of um, uh, requirements to um, well building um, that you can't get around. I think they are called um, preconditions. Um, and they're, they're the things that are not optional inside of that rating system. If you want to get a rating, there you have to address these things. And one of them is uh, uh, called circadian lighting. And um, it is about stimulating those biological responses inside of human beings. Um, the, it's the way that we, our metabolic systems are kind of set right by exposure to sunlight. And uh, it gets us in these kind of diurnal rhythms. You know, we experience different intensities and colors of light over the course of a day. And if you are somehow pulled out of that natural loop, let's say you're working in a in a basement with no windows, or maybe you're working the night shift, it can really uh, kind of uh, negatively impact your physical existence. Uh, so uh, it's a priority and well to work that, that kind of natural experience of light into your experience of being in a building. And uh, it's very challenging to do because it's hard to imitate sunlight. It's very powerful. It's a unique part of the spectrum. It's kind of full spectrum lighting. So in our case, in the workspace, uh, I encourage you to go check this out if we're touring, touring around, you're going to see these linear lights, which are basically kind of the workhorse lights. They are just giving you a baseline level of illumination at your desk. There are also some round lights that you will see sprinkled throughout. Those are designed not to shine down on your desktop or um, your desktop, uh, but on your face, actually. So they, um, well, they may not be perfectly tuned right now, but uh, they are each individual in the open work area has one of these lights associated with their chair. And those are adjustable lights. The idea is they are going to put some light directly onto your face and actually directly into your irises in a way that is not disturbing to your actual workflow. Um, but that is... 
uh, that is sort of the nature of how that well uh, credit works. It's about getting a certain level of a certain quality of light directly onto your face. That's how you stimulate that kind of circadian rhythm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, it's totally new to me, uh, and I'm still not a little shaky on all the credits, to be honest with you, but um, uh, it's very new. It's a very new rating system. Uh, at the time that we started this project, it was in pilot or kind of beta uh, version, and uh, it was Nancy's ambition um, to have the team address it. Um, and we actually have, um, you know, I represent a much larger team at Gensler. We had um, uh, dedicated individuals who are really working on trying to figure out these new well requirements that haven't really uh, been uh, exercised that often on projects in the world. You know, what does it mean for this project? How are we going to interpret a uh, particular credit? How are we going to figure out how to solve for that requirement? Um, so, no, it's very new. And I think um, at the moment, Joseph, uh, my colleague, may know, but I, I believe there may, may only be one project in the district that has actually come out on the other side of, of the well building standard. So uh, there is a kind of uh, certification process for this uh, project that requires assessors to come into your space and verify that you are meeting all the objectives that you've laid out. Um, but uh, when that occurs, I, I think you know ASLA might be the second uh, space in the district to, to have that certification. Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, and you may actually be much better grounded in terms of what the actual requirements are, but I can just speak about it generally. Um, you know, working in an open environment, one of the, the most common, and, you know, lead and well push you to open environments because we need to, we need to see the outdoors. So you got to start pulling some of these walls down. You remember that photo the high partitions and the, the space that was here before. A lot of people couldn't, couldn't get a glimpse of daylight in that space. So you gotta start bringing those walls down. As you do that, there's more sound moving around more easily. And uh, one of the most common complaints of green projects these days is that people are struggling to get their work done because they're so distracted by sound in the space. Another thing that happens with green projects is a lot of time you don't build ceilings because you're trying to minimize your use of materials. Um, and if you lose a lot of acoustic qualities in the ceiling, you can really have um, people are struggling to work. So in the case of, of this space here, you know, we have no ceiling here, um, which is, um, this is the most extensive open ceiling area in the building. And we did it here because it's a big space. If we, if we didn't open it up, it would feel like the ceiling was kind of crushing you. Um, and you will see in here that there are these strips of, of look, kind of ropey looking material, these panels up here. These are uh, acoustical baffles of the kind that are absorbing sound in this space. When we get up into the office space, we do have a fair amount of, of lay-in ceiling that has acoustical properties, but we also have a white noise uh, generating system um, that when you walk up there, I don't know if you can tell how generally quiet it is in the space. You can sort of hear the HVAC, but this is a super quiet HVAC system. I mean, we're, you know, a bunch of people in here, all these machines are essentially kind of running full force and it's still pretty quiet. Uh, when you get up to the upper floors, it's just as quiet, but um, in that case, you introduce extra noise that almost sounds like HVAC so that people um, uh, basically sense a, a kind of acoustical separation from each other. So there are a couple subtle things going on to manage the open environment in terms of acoustics. Anything else?
And thank you all for coming. And any of you who uh, don't forget your LASIS credits and uh, anyone who hadn't had a chance to tour the building and now that you know what to look for, you want to do that, we've got staff around who can help um, take you around and show you some of the features. So um, once again, let's thank Lisa and Abram. Thank you.